excited that you're here. Um, I love, love, love Google Slides. Like you, I talk fast normally, but then sometimes when I get to, like I get to share more about even something I'm way more passionate about. Um, I, so I will definitely uh, probably give you way more than you could handle. But this is the idea of that. My last session, I didn't. I was slowed down, and I let you have a lot of it, you know time to explore. That will be this too. Um, but I left my slides at the end because almost every slide that I'm going to share with you has like clickable things and then you'll like get lost. Like I do usually, like you click on something and you're like, oh, like I forgot that they were presenting. So I have kind of, I want to share um, about six or seven different ways to use Google Slides and then have you kind of look through those um, at another time, which I know never happens. But I want to show you the different things so that you can just take the idea of this though is just so you can find one new way of doing it. So I'm going to show you about seven ways and you're like, oh, I really like the drag and drop. I'm going to run with that one. So it's not the idea that you're going to run with all six of them because that would leave you with your head spinning, but it will at least be one idea hopefully that you can walk away with today. So up on the screen, my name is Marissa Dahl and I'm one of the uh, digital learning consultants here at Heartland AEA, which is located uh, in Johnston. I serve Ankeny and Urbandale West and uh, Ames and all of the schools around there all the way up to Colo Nesco. That's my area that I serve. So if you guys are in that area, uh, I am your consultant. But there are um, four others on my team for the Heartland AEA as well as around the whole state of Iowa. We have um, consultants that do a uh, similar work that I do. So hopefully they are there to support you. My Twitter handle is there at the bottom. Oh, that's not showing up very well on this slide. But I, uh, I have two kids uh, at home and then uh, a husband as well. So it's a little bit about me. But a little bit, oh, and then I was a former elementary teacher. So you're going to see there, they, it, it's not really balanced. So it's a little heavy on the elementary examples. But I do have some, high, some more uh, secondary examples as well. So hopefully you can find um, something. If you are looking for secondary, there will be some opportunities that you can click and find other opportunities for that secondary level. Or if you kind of have an eye for it, you're like, okay, I can see how that works for fifth. Um, I can, you know, I can change that to make it work for high school as well. Um, just to know who I have in the room, do I have some uh, elementary teachers? Oh, yeah, okay. I feel like I'm in a good group of uh, fellow educators. Uh, secondary. All right, thank you for joining us. I will definitely have uh, examples uh, that I hope that, that will hit for you too. And then administrators. All right, welcome. So I want to start with a little bit of data. How many of you have ever taken like the Clarity slash Bright Bite survey? Okay, have you ever looked at the data? Okay, some of you are nodding. Okay, what I wanted to do is pull out just a couple of the data points because I want to show you what, this is the up-to-date data as of um, this fall, but I want to show you why I chose these points and why it, it, it matches and it fits my presentation. So the first data point is the students are asked to choose digital tools to help complete their work. Um, what does this data tell us? What can you gather from this? They don't do it a lot. What? <laughs> okay. So if you think about it, like 34% of our students are doing that weekly. And then we're thinking, okay, what are they doing? You know, it makes me think, what tools are they using? But not only that, like, are they using it to um, regurgitate information, copy and paste it? Are they really thinking about the content that they're putting on there? And is it really making a critical game? That makes me, that's what my questions are. The next one is they're asked to develop multimedia presentations. So if we had 26% of our students doing this weekly, we want to make sure that hopefully we're not just asking for a Google slide every single presentation. Like every single time that we get them reading this book, you're going to do this. Or every time we get them doing this science project, you're going to do a Google slide. I hope to show you some other opportunities that whether you're still using Google slides, what else could you do besides just do a Google uh, presentation. Uh, another one asks to create music, art, movies, and podcasts. How many is that weekly? 15%. And so when we think about how to use Google Slides, I'm going to show you how you can create art um, as well as so we can try to see that create more of that creativity <coughs> inside of Google Slides. So which ones are we already using? Are you guys using Google Slides? How many of you are using Google Slides? 
Awesome. How many of you use like, Google Draw? Oh, nice. Nice. Very nice. So brace yourself. I kind of like a little bit of memes here. But brace yourself. This is not another. This is not another power uh, point slide presentation. This will hopefully be something a little bit more than that. So this is where the magic happens when you think about the power of what Google Slides has to offer. So this is beyond just a presentation tool. I have used Google Slides to make invites, to create newsletters, to um, put, put uh, pictures together to then download as pic, uh, JPEGs. I use Google Slides for just about everything these days. So why, why Google Slides? So a little bit of, okay, if some of you are really comfortable in using Google Docs, you're thinking, well, why do I, use, why do I need to use Google Slides over Google Docs? The reason I use Google Docs over Google over sorry, the reason I use Google Slides over Google Docs is because I'm kind of picky with with uh, um, formatting objects like text boxes and pictures. Um, I see a lot of nods, so I'm glad I'm not the only one. But when you add a picture into a Google Doc and it says like text wrapping of one eighth, I want like zero text wrapping. Like I want that to be an option because I want to put it where I want to put it, and I don't want a big a bunch of white space. So in Google Slides, you're able to do that. You're able to put your Google picture wherever you want. You're able to put text wherever you want. So that was the main reason of why I wanted to, um, why I use Google Slides more. Another way, which I'm going to show you that, another way I'm going to show you about too is the fact that I can download them as JPEGs, as PDFs, as um, anything that I want, um, even at a higher enough pixel where I can go and get it printed at uh, Kinko's or uh, Walmart is where I usually send them, and they're at a high quality. So the one, th the things I'm going to show you today that you can do with Google Slides uh, is this list right here. So that's why I want, that's why I kind of preference this to say like these are the things I want to show you. But like I said, I hope that you can at least just take one away from this list to try. So the first one is a social story. How many of you have ever written a social story? So a social story, especially for those early childhood uh, educators, is just a story to help our students remember that this is how we, where we put our hands, this is where we, how we line up, this is how we use the restroom, and kind of like things like that. Well, one of our consultants had, um, her son was working, he was working on making better choices, and so he's like, well, I'm going to put a digital story or a, a social story together. And when I was in the classroom, social stories were like, hey, this kid needs a social story, then like, in like two months I'll get back to you, because they had to get pictures of the kid doing all these things. They had to make sure that the light bulbs were on there, and they had to get it printed. It took forever. <coughs> so instead, this guy um, decided to make his own, and he made it in Google Slides. So here is page one, and so he's changed the layout um, and the page set up to eight and a half by 11. So that's the cover. And then he said, hi, my name's Patrick, I'm a big boy. Everyone we do, we do centers, we work in different skills. So different parts of the day, you just have like transitions and things like that. Sometimes it's not my favorite thing to do to stay in center. So this is a way that he used it and then he was able to print it. And every teacher had it, and the parent had it, and everyone was able to be consistent with the same social story. And he was able to add pages as needed um, when all of a sudden another behavior came up. It was still consistent. It was the same, still the same book, but yet they were able to add pictures. So that is one of the ways he used, uh, he would use Google Slides. Here is where you can then download it as a PDF. So then um, he printed it actually through PDF. And I think he even got it on like photo paper and like had it um, book. Another one is comic strips. So each one of the pages. So have you any of them ever used comics? Uh, oh gosh, what's comics? Oh, I can't even think of it. Comic life. Yes, and there was like wasn't that the one that was like like, like paid for like oh, yeah. So instead of using kind of like, I like to come out when people are like, hey, I used to use this program, but now what should I use now? Because they don't know, because they don't want to pay for it. Or it actually took a long time for them to even like find, get an account and things like that. I said, well, let's use Google Slides instead, because they already have a Google account and they already know how to use it. 
And so they just chose to use it. They found a background, put some pictures in front of it with some speech bubbles. And then they had a comic strip. You know, you could even make it um, smaller. So you could say it's five by two. This is actually just a typical widescreen on the page setup. But you could show it, you know, you could make it, which I'm going to show you is how to do page setup and make a little strips instead. And then you could put um, like the strips together and things like that. So that's the comic strips example. As well as digital stories, which is very similar to social story, but I think of the digital, digital stories as more about the kids writing stories. I used to use a lot of little bird tales. Um, I still use a little bit of write, write to read or read to write. But this is another example of they're like, you know, I don't want to make more accounts. I want to just stick to something they maybe already know, because they maybe know a little bit about Google Docs. This is a way they actually can use Google Slides to make their own digital story. So when we think about the how-to stories or our Lucy Culkins, they have a, do a lot of the stories. They can easily decide to use um, any of or in those um, projects or in those examples. You could build in using a digital story using Google Slides instead of you know, doing a handwritten, or you could choose to publish it. One of the standards starting um, actually in kindergarten on up is that they have to digitally publish their work, whether it says, you know, with, with support, with guidance and support, all the way up to like printing out or typing up a page up in fourth grade. So this is one of the things that they could use to digitally publish their work to be Google Slides, just in a different format, uh, eight and a half by 11. As in, like I said, it can be printed on eight and a half 11 page. There are some examples here across the side. Um, this is even like some app matching for those of you who might be um, looking at maybe more an advanced tool is to use Screencastify on top of Google Slides and then you will be able to provide an audio recording to go with the book. So if the kid wrote the book and then you read it, you're able to get a little picture at the bottom. So those are some ideas on digital stories. Another one is stop motion video. I really had a, it was interesting trying to work with this because I had a district that didn't want to use, didn't want to use the other like extensions that you could use for stop motion. So I forced myself to learn how to use Google Slides to do stop motion. And what they did is they took all the pictures, they used them as the background of the slide, and then they published it with a three or a point zero three um, uh, road, or a uh, skip or whatever, go to the next slide, and it automatically created one. Now, are there other things that are easier to do? Yes, but this is one of the district wanted to use this, and so I thought, you know what? If there's other people who don't want to download the extensions and do all that with other programs, this is a way that you could use Google Slides for stop motion video. And like I said, I have a ton of links on the side to give some examples of how. The one on the bottom, the stop motion lesson template, that is the one I created for a district. Um, they were doing a STEM day, they wanted me to come in and I did. It was like, here's a video on how to use Play-Doh for stop motion, here's a video on how to use Legos and then drawing and they kind of had, a, they could choose which um, medium they wanted to use and then they could use either Google Slides, they could learn how to use it or they did have some other examples of, some other choices of apps as well. So that is a template, and they had to talk about beginning, middle, and end, so there's standards tied into that one as well. It wasn't just a stop motion video. They did have to talk about, some, or there were some ELA standards tied to that. Um, another one, and I have to always give credit to Kim Collins in Knoxville. I teach, I teach a GAC for Littles class. This is one of the examples that she had given, and I loved it because it was very much um, something that you would, uh, typically do on a worksheet, but it was actually kind of more creative and more collaboration. So what happened, this is kind of like at a center uh, or a station, so the students kind of sat down, this is slide one, it says gum costs 64 cents. Student one comes up and on that first bar at the top, clicks on these, so if he wants to make 64 cents, he clicks on this quarter, moves it up there, clicks on a quarter, moves it up there, and then takes a dime and then four pennies. So then that's how they made 64. Okay, good job with student one. Student one walks away, student two sits down, figures out if that's right. If it's right, they put a star next to it. And then the next row down here, that kid makes 64 another way. So now you've gone to see if they, if that student now has now counted change to see if their student, if the last peer was correct and has made another way. And then the next student comes down and so on and on and on. 
This was one of the examples the teacher created, but then I challenged her to say, okay, now let's have kids create those. Like, let's have kids figure out, you know, what could, what's something they could buy, how much does it cost, and they could actually add a slide, and they could make their own um, math activity. So really what this is, is this is just clip art on top of each other. So a ton, like I don't even know how many are there, but maybe 10 quarters, and they're just layered on top of each other. So this is what we call drag and drop manipulatives. I've also created ones um, that are a little less, or a little bit more like a digital pacifier. I've been, I've been a kind of a, a person to say, here's a way to start off. Like here's a way that you could definitely make it more of a center and more um, and less and less like just a uh, a digital worksheet and more of a little bit more thinking. So I've done it where they've done patterns where they say, you know, put what's the next one, choose the next, you know, choose the next one, the next shape. I've done it where it's uh, like a B and an S, and then which words, what word starts with B, what word starts with S, and so they had to like drag and drop the pictures. I've done them where they've had animals. We talked about there's a, one of the standards is habitat, so they had to decide which ones live in the desert and which ones live in the ocean. So many different activities like that. Um, and then they've used screen Castify on top of it to explain their answer. So that is some examples of some drag and drop manipulatives. Another one is for a drag and drop manipulative is an ELA example of them doing kind of a progressive story where the students had a predetermined set of emojis that you'll see on the <coughs> left on slide three and four. So on the first line, they had to choose a emoji from slide three. So they had to learn to copy and paste that. And then on the second uh, line, they had to choose some, uh, an emoji from slide number four. And so that was kind of a way the teacher kind of could limit how many rehearsal appropriateness, and then also just not getting lost in what all the, what are all the emojis I could choose from. And then they dragged and dropped them to where they wanted to in their example, and then they had to click and um, tell them the effect, like what happens when you give a baby a pacifier. So they kind of had that, pro that cause and effect book, and they had examples from every kid. <laughs> Some of the ways that you can add emojis, another way, this is a GIF that's showing you how to add emojis into a Google Doc. You can actually do this in any of them. Uh, actually, I don't know if you can do it in sheets. But uh, insert special characters, and then there's actually down here, you can go to emojis, and you'll get a bunch here. There's not as much as you ch can choose, like on a typical phone, but there's a plenty of them that you can use. These are not that. These are just different clip art that she found to add to that, so those are not emojis, those are just different pictures. Uh, one of the things you might want to note is Emojipedia does have um, emojis that you can use um, that are images, and you can Google about any emoji that you'd ever need. But I like them because they are images. These are text, these are in place of a text character, so they're not able, you're not able to move them around as easily um, instead of using them as a picture. So Emojipedia is one of my favorite bookmarks. Um, just for this example of using them. Um, I've seen them for math uh, problems and also storytelling. And then also back in the day where you'd see like, uh, I see a house, but instead of the word house, you have to see a house. I've seen teachers create uh, stories like that using pictures instead of words. Um, another one, I've had a lot of questions about using Google Slides for digital portfolios. And I was actually blown away with some of the examples that teachers have used and found off Teachers Pay Teachers, which I'm sure is not something everyone's ever, no one's probably ever stood up there and presented and said, hey, there are some good stuff on there. There is. There's definitely some good stuff on there. But so using this idea, one of the districts I work with actually was able to choose, they did, did find one off of um, Teacher Pay Teacher, but they modified it. So they were able to turn it to 8.5 by 11. And they had tabs down the side, which are really just links to a different, to another section. Um, and they were able to put, put, uh, put videos in there, links to artifacts, links to enabling, and then even able to put Screencastify on top of that. So they used digital slides, or uh, Google Slides, to you for a digital portfolio. So there's some examples of the ones that I found um, on Teachers Pay Teachers, but then also know that a lot of us, we love creating them as well. Um, and so I've actually worked with some of our districts to take some of these and modify them to, make, to meet their standards. Um, how many of you have ever used or worked with HyperDocs? A few of you, okay, great. So this is a little bit of HyperDocs. This teacher and the dean, which I'm hoping someday we'll meet her, 
but she has some really great examples of hyperdocs <coughs> that um, are tied to standards. So she's a K5 integrationist in Illinois, and she's created these hyperdocs that are, like I said, tied to different standards. And they all follow a very similar uh, flow chart or flow. So they go from, oh, and this one doesn't have them. But they go from like explain, apply. And so what this, this is a specific example is from biography. And so what they have to learn about is some, what could they write about their biography. And so this gives them a kind of a menu. You'll see down here. So show what you know. So this is kind of a hyperdoc because if they have there, any of you ever used like a web quest, web quest back in the day? So it's kind of like a web quest, but it's all in a doc instead. So they can choose between these different items to apply their learning or to, to actually for this example to create their uh, the uh, biography. They can choose any of these examples. Ooh. So she has all of these, like I said, created. I'm gonna show, oh, this is our planning sheet. So then there's little text boxes here. I'm gonna go to her, um, her examples, because you will find, like these are all the different examples for all the different grades. So if I click on third grade, and then there's a front page of what they look like. And they're tied, oh, there, here's, this is the one I want. They're all tied to the Indiana standards, so they're pretty similar to uh, Iowa standards. But you'll notice on the side, they are um, labeled with these over here. This is what I was looking for. Explore, explain, apply. So the first one is explore, which is usually two videos. I need you to watch these. So it's task number one. I need you to watch these. And then I need you to go to Flipgrid. Sometimes it's Flipgrid, sometimes it's Seesaw. Explain what you learned about. So this example is like, what was the theme of the things, the videos that you watch. So then they have to go to Flipgrid, which these are things that she's taught them to do. It wasn't just first uh, introduced here. And then they had to apply it. So what is the theme? So they had to apply their learning. And then they usually can choose between um, which ways to apply it. So they could either do a, mo a song, a movie, or a book. And then they had to either post, sometimes like either they have to post that to Seesaw or they have to do something with that. So it's kind of just a way for them to kind of, it's like a digital lesson that's, that is given to them to either learn or to show their learning. But she's got um, all of these. So this is, this is just, this is third grade. But you have access to all of those um, using, let's see, from that link. From this link right here. It also has a book, or I have a little bit of what are hyperdocs. There also is a book called uh, by the Google team Hyperdocs as well that Heartland has that you can check out. It gives you a little more explanation of what Hyperdocs are if you're looking at possibly creating those. So the thing I do want to show you is actually how to do these things and not just tell you that you can do them. So I'm going to walk you, for those of you who want to give this a try, I'm going to walk you through. So if you are on my slides, if you want to go up to File, New, and make a new Google Doc, or sorry, make a new Google Slide, I'm going to show you how to change the page settings so that instead of widescreen, you're now going to be either, if you're going to look at a, say, uh, Instagram post as a 10 by 10, a uh, picture 5 by 7, or you're going to do 8 and a half by 11. So here, once you've created it, if you go down to File, and then go down to Page Setup. You're going to come up with a box that says, like, it looks like number two. And you're going to go down. So right now you're set to widescreen. You're going to click on that and go to custom. And then in that box where it says customize, you can go 8.5 by 11 or 11.5 by 18, depending if you want it landscape or portrait. And then what you should have received, you should have gotten a, you should have either gotten a landscape or portrait. Did it work for everybody? See some nods? Do you guys think that they're like, oh wow, I never knew that would happen. Did I shock anybody with that? Did I shock? 
<laughs> um, and then, so right there, you can't just start typing. You do have to then add content. So that's where he comes with on the top. You'll get these examples or these options. So right, the first thing you need to do is add a text box. And there might already, actually there might, the layout, there might have already been one uh, there for you. Sometimes I just write demo or just trying this out. And then the next one is adding an image. So you can also add an image. So what I really like about this option, uh, this uh, capability is that a lot of our districts have Chromebooks. And so they're, you know, while they're working on a, in science, or if they're working on a Google or on a, uh, something that they made in the block center, or they're working on some of their writing, they can actually take a photo right in this, uh, I don't think I, yeah, they can actually take, click on that picture and take a photo. So it allows them to, if they were working on something, being able to put like an artifact of a photo there. So if I go to insert image, these are all my example, or my opportunity, or my uh, choices. And if I go to camera, it opens my camera, and for some of our like Chromebooks, you're able to actually change the photo and make it from the background. But I have a lot of kids like pick up their picture or pick up their Chromebook and like get a picture of whatever they're making. We were making some towers the other day um, in another classroom, and so they wanted to capture actually they wanted to capture how big their tower was and then share how they built it. And so that's what we had them do. So camera. There's the picture right here, and I can insert it. I can take a bunch, and then it inserts it right away. So especially on the Chromebook, because it's so, because you're taking a like, picture somewhere else, and then you never know if they're in the documents folder or if they're in the desktop, this is a way that they can just stay right inside of Google Slides and add uh, content that way. The hardest part about that is just getting them to like, sometimes have to move the Chromebook to get the right picture. The other examples are tied to their Google, their uh, Google uh, Pit Photos or Google Drive, or they can search the web. The other one is a backdrop. So if they wanted to change the backdrop to different colors, that's a way for them to be creative. And we'll, but I'm going to show you another way to get some fancy pictures for a backdrop. This is another uh, tool that you can add to your Google Slides, and I use them a lot in my presentations, is uh, Icon, by, sorry, actually I use Insert Icons for Google Slides. I have both of them downloaded, depending on which one has the right image that I need, but I would say I use Insert Icons for Google Slides most. Um, this is a way for you to add just about any icon that you want into your slides. So whether it's a talking, a speech bubble, a Wi-Fi symbol, a arrow, I mean, a Twitter, a Facebook, it, I mean anything. There are so many and they're free. Uh, insert icons for Google Slides is free. Uh, icon by Nouns Project, most of them are free, but it's usually like the one that you really want is not. So I use both of them just depending on which one has the one I want. Um, but I get love both of those for Google Slides. I use those about every day. Like these, this little Twitter, uh, this little uh, Twitter thing is one. Um, I love the Heartland colors up there. Actually, we have like Heartland AA has branded colors that we have to use, and you can turn these any color you want. So you put in the color up here in that where it says color. You have to type in the number, or you can just click on it and choose a color if you don't know your color. But I like the opportunity of being able to pick by color. How many of you has anyone ever used the icons for slides? Oh, a couple of you. Good job. Another one that I use all the time is Unsplash. They have some of the best pictures available. I've seen some nods. Um, these are also all free. So you can search while in Google Slides. If you have the Unsplash add-on, you can search. I typed in fall, and that's what I came up with. All the ones you see on the right. Don't have to worry about um, copyright. You don't have to worry about any of that. These are all copyright free. So you can able to just click on anything you want and add it. But I, this is also the safest one. I, I try, I went through all of my little tricks to find, like, trying to find bad pictures, and I can't. So I can't, I'm not going to say it's 100% safe, but I have, I've gone through my little, like, you know, you find words that you could usually, for sure, you're going to find something bad. That has not happened. 
Um, Pixabay, it used to happen a lot more. That's another one, but I kind of stopped saying it for a while because I was finding some pretty iffy pictures. Um, that is safe now. I, for me, that I, the lately have when I've used it and I've typed in things that usually typically do come up with bad pictures, um, they don't. Pixabay is not an add-on though. Pixabay is another website that you actually download the pictures from. But both of them have wonderful, wonderful pictures that you can add to slideshows and definitely um, makes it a little bit more prettier and for the viewer a little bit ever better um, for that. So I've used Unsplash for background as well as templates. So I'm going to share with you in a minute. This is how I like I showed you in that first one. This is how there's a, these are the download options. So we all, I always choose the JPEG. If I want to use it for like a Twitter picture, if I wanted to use it for a Facebook picture, or, or like I said, I make all my ber kids' birthday invitations using Google Slides, I always download as JPEG. So that allows it to be a picture and that I can do more things with. How many of you ever use the templates in the Google? A couple of you? I feel like this is, I don't use, utilize these as much as I probably should utilize them. But what it allows you to do if you set the master, so if you have one that you're, you want your students to always you know, have their name up in the left-hand corner, a box here and a box there, if you want to set some options for them, like you always want their reflection here and their artifact here, you can set up templates for them so that when, it go, when they go in and say click new slide, it gives them these template options. So you set these, you set the color, you set the background, you set the um, font, and things like that, and you can set that as your master. These are all the different templates. So in this example, for the um, Google Certified Trainer uh, presentation template, these are all the templates that I could use. And I can't change those. So those are things that if you wanted to give kids some um, things that they couldn't change, so like a background or some sort of template that you didn't want them to like click on and move around, you can set them as your backdrop and set them as um, your master, and then they can't go in. And I can't, like if I chose this, this Google Sheet one, I can't click in. These are part of the background. This is one of the examples I got a lot, especially more last year, where when they came across, when the Iowa released the new Iowa assessments, where you had to um, do a lot more typing. People are like, my kids need to do more typing. What do I do? And I thought, well, let's think about some authentic examples. And I do, there is an argument on, you know, how we need to do the FFTT. And I'm in the third grader right now, having to learn how to type. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. You know, I've been there, done that. I, th I said, well, I learned how to do that in fourth grade. And you wanted to argue. Why didn't you do that? Why do I have to do it in third grade? I have to do it in fourth grade. But um, this is one of the examples I did create for the some of my district to think about that authentic typing. It's just giving them an example, possibly just more of a routine. So maybe on Monday, these are the kids, I need you to grab your Chromebooks and you're going to write about your weekend. So I'm not looking at how much time, how much you typed. I'm not grading you on how many, you know, capital letters you have. I really, this is just for you to have an opportunity to digitally to write and type and maybe even add some pictures if you want. So this is a template that you have access to that it has the teacher, teacher direction. So maybe you are going to just, uh, deliver or uh, send this out via Google Classroom. But it's, it's not for, you know, it's not to grade it, it's just for them to give an example of, tell me what you did over the weekend, add pictures, add videos. You can even add, add a, you know, share with the teacher, or share with another kid for them to comment. So it's just kind of a way for them to just have experience, have a chance to do it where it's not being, um, you know, red pen, it's not gonna be graded as far as like looking for capital letters and how much you write, it's just for them to, Get some typing down. Also, the, this uh, teacher has were, used templates for creating newsletters. So the students actually wrote the newsletter. So I have little, I had boxes to where, okay, what do we do for math? And you get, okay, you're the person that gets to write for math, and you guys put in what we did for reading. Here's here's my photo library. Choose you know choose some of the pictures. So they actually kind of did a collaborative newsletter, and the students put it together. So those are, that is most of what I had, the gist of it, but I do want to share with you a couple of things that Heartland has to offer. Um, we have a, what's called the Innovation seri Webinar Series. We have these three authors coming up. We just had the Tech Rabbi. We have Matt Miller, Jeff Williams, Aaron Kurtz, and Monica Burns coming up 
These are courses or just standalone pieces that you could um, join us for free, unless you want to take it for credit. I think it's $35 if you want to, but it's out, it's on your own time. It's not, uh, you don't have to come to Heartland for it. You can do it anywhere you are, anywhere in the state of Iowa, but there's one license renewal credit if you want to, which includes a book study. And then also uh, we, we record the webinar so you can watch it later. So we really want to provide some learning opportunities that don't require you to come out of the classroom that you could do on your own time. Um, and, and connect with these amazing authors. So we're actually looking forward to um, session two starting up at the end of this month. Um, and if you are, they are available on the statewide learning system. Um, we don't have the registration up quite yet, but we will. We're just finishing up round one with, like I said, the tech, the tech rabbi. Um, these are the courses that we have to offer. I teach three of these courses, but Heartland has, these are all, actually this is a mix between face-to-face -face and online. I teach maker spaces, K, pre-K-12, as well as the Seesaw ones, all online. So those are for the teacher license group. Um, I have them on an ongoing schedule, so they, about every two months I teach those. Um, but then last is our summer summit. We are hoping to be able to release our keynote by the end of this week, uh, but our summer summit's on June 10th. So this year, last year we had um, Jennifer Williams, who she kicked it off really awesome, and then we're looking forward to, like I said, releasing our keynote or soon. So my slides are here. If those of you who didn't, weren't able to capture those um, from the session resources for iTech, but that's a, that's a link to the slides for beyond um, the slideshow, if you wanted to take note of those. And then, thank you very much, and hope you had a great first day at iTech. <laughs>